If you have a Bible with you, please open it to 1 Peter chapter 1. We continue our study in Peter's first epistle. I'll be reading for us the end of chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, into the first three verses of chapter 2. And there's an outline of the sermon provided in the bulletin as well. Why don't you stand as a symbolic gesture of honoring the absolute authority of God's word among us. 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, you may be seated. <clears throat> Peter has created a very vivid picture for you. He is saying, step outside with me for a moment. Do you see the grass? It's beginning to wither. Do you see summer's flowers? They're beginning to fade. And we have a word for that. They are perishable. And he looks you in the eye and he says, so are you. You will eventually fade and die. And he holds up this book and he says, do you see this book? Unlike the grass and the flower, it will never fade. We have a word for it. It is imperishable. Like the God from which it came, this word is indestructible and has eternal life in itself. And do you see the good news? If the seed of this word gets in you, you also are indestructible and will never perish. And he says in the text that, this, that the word of God is actually the gospel. So that according to Isaiah, when the breath of the Lord goes over the grass and the flowers, they wither. When the breath of the Lord comes over your heart with the good news of Jesus crucified for you, you come to life by the power of that seed. Really exciting news. And he says, is that the end of my illustration? Do, do we go back inside? And you say, no, 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 no. There's something else besides the grass, the flowers, the work of Jesus on the cross, purifying our souls once and for all by his precious shed blood and the word of God. There's something else in the picture. What is it according to the text, beloved? What else is in the picture according to the text? Others. Do you see how he reasons? Verse 22, chapter 1. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Quick sidebar. It's probably not an allusion to the obedience of believing to be converted, but probably a, a picture of growing your, in your salvation. 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for what? For a sincere brotherly love. And then he says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Why? Since you've been born again by the imperishable seed. Do you see how Peter is directing you to the transforming power of the grace of the seed of the gospel implanted in you? The gospel creates a new relationship between God and you. He accepts you. He loves you. He surrounds you with this kindness. And the gospel creates a new relationship between you and other people. How? That looks like the burden of the text. How? What does that look like? What it looks like is a matter of what motivates you in your relationships, and that is insincere motives versus sincere. So that's going to be, that's going to frame our discussion this morning based on this text. A new relationship is born. John just emphasized it by virtue of our union with Christ. We have union with each other. And Peter is unpacking some of the gory and glorious details of that. So, first of all, two contrasts relating to one another with insincere motives versus then secondly sincere. Well, insincere. Look at uh, chapter 2 verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander. The verb put away means to reject something unwanted. Um, a bee lands on you outside, Pew, quick as you can, right? You're by a campfire, a burning coal comes up and lands on you, quick as you can, put it away. Now Peter is writing to people who love Jesus and they still need to do this. What can we say about malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander? It's a representative list of things that really aren't so nice. You might just call it junk. What can we say about them? Well, the potential for every one of these is in your heart. Do you believe that? The seed of every one of the only given enough pressure in any situation will these come rising to the surface. We can also say that when these are present in relationships they function to pollute relationships and to break them down. In other words, relationships don't work on these. So if these are in your sibling relationships, your spouse, your work relationships, your church committee meetings, if these are in there those relationships aren't going to work. God didn't build relations to flourish on these things. We can also say that it's painful to be on the receiving end of these. Do you like people being malicious towards you? Do you like them slandering you? Do you like people being hypocr hypocritical with you? Of course you don't. No one likes to be treated like this. And when we do, we actually inflict harm on Jesus' little lambs. When you allow these things to persist in relationships, you are withholding good and inflicting harm on Jesus' little lambs. And the last thing we might observe about these is they usually involve volatile emotion expressing itself in slashing words. Malice, envy. Well, you might be wondering, why, Mike, are you calling these insincere? Here's why, according to the text. You and I can't say Jesus has purified my heart. The promise of the gospel. By virtue of his death for you, he shed blood. Your soul is one, the moment you believe the gospel, is once and for all purified of all sin. You can't say, my soul's been purified by the blood of Jesus and treat people like this. That's hypocrisy. Or to put it this way, you can't say the Lord has opened up a fountain of grace for me and be malicious towards others. It's hypocrisy. And people outside the church happen to notice it when we treat each other this way. It would be like claiming to be a car safety fanatic, but you routinely go 20 miles over the speed limit and never wear your seatbelt. That's called hypocrisy. So where does all this stuff come from? 
Do you think this comes from a heart that is fixated on the glory of God, the majesty of God, the righteousness of God, the beauty of God, the purity of God, the stunning creative genius of God? Do you think a heart fixated on this produces this? It doesn't, does it? No, there's something going on. It must be a self-absorbed vacuum of self concern heart that if you begin to strip it away you would see this heart is not at peace with God and this heart is probably full of anger and people that are angry but don't necessarily know it end up being abusive and manipulative do you like living with that kind of person are you that kind of person so Peter is forcing you, beloved, to ask yourself, do my relationships invariably become demanding, selfish, self-protective, self-promoting, serving my ends and needs? Are people basically in my life as objects to serve my purpose? Ask that of every relationship in your life. Are your poorly placed words springing from a self-absorbed heart, which is ultimately dissatisfied with Christ? These are some of the questions Peter is asking you. And Peter is also sh showing you the only power on earth to overcome these things. You know, John prayed for our culture. Our culture is a mess. There's more, it seems to be acrimony and divisiveness and a division than ever before. We, some of us met down in the park in Abington in the summertime for the big vigil and there were just hundreds and hundreds of incredibly sincere, well-meaning people there. Only one person that spoke had the answer. It was Mark Davis from New Life Glenside. And he said the answer is Jesus. Every other human attempt to overcome the vileness in human hearts will never work. Human beings have been trying it without Jesus since the dawn of time and we still can't get along and we never will. The only power to displace vileness from human hearts is in the eternal Word of God ministering the love of Jesus. That's the only hope, beloved. And this church God has planted to play a role in this community to that end in these times. Join with your elders and deacons and deaconesses in thinking about what that looks like. How exciting. And beloved, what exactly is it that the Word of God, according to this text, reveals that is powerful to change the agenda of your heart is that you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, that the Lord is good. That's, that seems to be the focus of it. Do you see what Peter's saying? Relationships informed and shaped by the Word of God will actually look like the Word of God, full of grace, truth, and sincerity. <laughs> That's not rocket science. That's just really encouraging. That's the first point. Remember the picture outside? Grass, flowers, you, but the eternal word of God in you, the gospel. Now you're imperishable. That's not the end of the picture. We've got other people. And we're relating to other people either out of insincere motives or sincere. Here are the earnestly sincere motives that Peter alludes to. Chapter 1, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Sincere brotherly love. That's, that's a phileo. And then the next love in the chapter is agape. Love one another earnestly from the heart. What question is Peter answering, kind of? Isn't he answering the question, what makes visible the invisible seed of the Word of God? What's the answer? What makes it visible? Love. Love makes visible the indestructible, eternal Word of the Gospel. And what kind of love springs from a purified heart? It's sincere. Literally, the Greek is not hypocritical. The kind of love with which Jesus has loved you. So I want to tease out as we finish four tangible aspects of that love. I want you 
husbands and wives to apply this to your marriage. And those of you who have brothers and sisters, I want you to apply it to the way you relate to your brothers and sisters. Four tangible aspects. First, earnest, sincere love is honest. It's honest. Because when, when the Word of God begins to deal with you, you get ruthless with what's wrong with you. You stop blaming other people. You take ownership. You, you read, how many have read Proverbs 29 a few days ago? I know everybody in my Proverbs study did. I think it was in Proverbs 29 and it says, uh, what man can say he's made his heart pure? I can't. Deal ruthlessly with yourself. Ask yourself, what's wrong with me? Show me. Could that be me, the fool, the adulterer, the juvenile? Could that be me? One theologian put it this way, serious takers of the Word of God are severe to themselves, tender to others. Is that you and your spouse? Severe to yourself, tender to your spouse. If you're an honest person and you're married, you will wake up in the morning and you'll say this, Lord, I am the greatest threat to the welfare of my marriage. Lord Jesus, if left to myself, I will ruin my marriage, not my spouse. I will. My demandingness, my pettiness, my selfishness, my self-absorption. I, my sin is the greatest threat to the welfare of my marriage. If you're an honest person, you will say that. And you will plead the Lord to save your marriage from you. And who can say that but the person who knows Jesus has their back? He's got your back. All you need. The stuff you're trying to get from your spouse, Christ has already given you. And more than you can handle. <laughs> You've got nothing to prove. You're free to focus on the other person. You don't have to fear not getting your way. Christ has your back. So they're honest. Secondly, they're humble. How do we think about humility? Humility is God's giving you a new pair of glasses. Humility is treating others the way God has treated you. And the way God has treated you is fundamentally because of Jesus. He's treated you out of mercy and grace. Mercy is you're not getting what you deserve. Grace is you get what you don't deserve. The humble heart says every morning I need to see other people the way God sees me. I'm going to look you through the lens of mercy. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And grace, I can give you what you don't deserve. It's so important. Let me tease out a few characteristics of mercy with some contrasts. As a rule, the humble do not want to be proud the proud do not want to be humble. As a rule, the humble see their pride and loathe it. The proud see humbling and loathe it. As a rule, the humble do not recognize their humility. The proud do not recognize their pride. As a rule, the humble boast in their weaknesses. The proud despise weakness. The humble long for what God wants. The proud long for what they want. The humble weigh their impact on others. The proud weigh others' impact on them. As a rule, the humble sorrow for their lack of gratitude. The proud feel no need for it. The humble look to God for help. The proud help themselves. The humble, as a rule, can initiate critical self-evaluation. The proud avoid it while criticizing others. As a rule, the humble grieve over their own faults. The proud obsess over the faults of others. As a rule, the humble are content to promote others. The proud long to be promoted. The humble see all possessions in life as a gift, the proud feel entitled to their possessions and even what they don't possess. And finally, the humble know they fare better than they deserve. The proud think they deserve better. Third characteristic element of an earnestly sincere heart, 
kindness. Peter says, as you long for the pure milk of the word of God, by it you may grow in respect to salvation. That longing is created by tasting that the Lord is good, tasting the Lord's kindness. Years ago, I was probably about 35 years old, I was playing pickup basketball at the University of Virginia with some college students. I was closely guarding one of these college students. I began to smell something. I was getting, and he was sweating, and I was sweating. And you know what I was smelling? Alcohol. This dude had so much to drink the night before, he was sweating alcohol out of his pores. You have feasted and nurtured your soul so richly on the pure milk of the word. You're sweating kindness. So God promises. Think of kindness as a gentle, not demanding, patiently waiting for people to change. Patiently waiting for people to change. And then finally, one element of earnestly sincere love is other-centeredness. In the history of the world, is there a place where we see other-centeredness most graphically illustrated, verbalized? There is. It's when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Being tormented in unspeakable, excruciating physical and spiritual agony. Jesus is more concerned for the welfare of his enemies than himself. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Meaning, the people for whom I am dying are not aware of the impact of their own sin, both on themselves and on God. The people for whom Jesus died initially have no sense. They are ignorant. They are clueless. They don't have knowledge of the impact of what their sin has done to them. Beloved, the reality is if you saw, you and I saw sin for what it does to us, we would be horrified at the prospect of ever sinning. That's the reality. And Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you were understood the impact of what your sin did to Jesus, you would stay as far from sin as from nuclear waste. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness of God requires you to say, in order to save me, God, you must kill your son in my place. That's what Christians have to do. You have to ask God to sacrifice his son in your stead. If that doesn't humble you and make you other-centered, nothing on earth will. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, put me in the place of judgment and forgive them. That's another word of saying he purifies your soul of all sin. He accepts you. You're made righteous. You're cleansed. You're eternally safe and therefore free to be outward looking in your life. So don't, don't try other centeredness without gospel flowing in your heart. It won't work and it'll kill you. <laughs> and you'll kill the other person. <laughs> but see, the, the beauty of the way the gospel works, it's, it's always inside out. You taste the kindness, you taste the gospel. This is what Jesus has done for you. And so he, here are a few ways of asking yourself, how do I know real gospel other-centeredness? Well, you're concerned about a couple of things. You're concerned, how do you experience me? I want to know that. Husbands, ask your spouse. How do you experience me? What's my impact on you? What am I like when I don't get what I want? You really want to know? The humble want to know because the humble want to change. 
The proud go, I don't need to change. You need, you need to do all the changing. Other centeredness says, do I tend to pull you towards me or push you from me? By my phone calls, my emails, the way I address problems, is what's my pull? Do I stop and get all the facts? Do I assume I know the full case of the story and come out with guns blazing? You like to be on the receiving end of that? Whoa, 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 Nellie. Other centered people stop before they react. And they're careful to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. Do my words, my tone, my posture, my demeanor, my eye contact craft a welcoming space for you? That's other centeredness. It matters to me how I'm coming across to you. Do my reactions, are spontaneous or pondered, create a pleasant environment? When you're interacting with someone, the question is, do you sense right now that you are more important to me than anybody else in the world? You get that sense when Jesus met people? He was all in. That's other-centeredness. And it only happens when you fall in love with someone so great, they will humble you. And so humble, they will melt your pride. His name is Jesus. And he gives you imperishable life. Let's pray. Your word, Lord Jesus, shows us we're awful. We can't hide from you. And your word invites us out of the dark ways we deceive ourselves in hypocrisy, thinking something we're not. It invites us into the light to Jesus, the one we just sung about, who is the way, the truth, the life, and the light. And in the light, though we see our sins, not all of them, <laughs> we see Jesus crucified for us. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We see a God who condescends to enter into our ignorance and misunderstanding and arrogance and say, I love you in spite of that. I want you to be mine. And we see a God who says, now treat each other the way I've treated you. It's a really good plan, Father. I, we can't improve on it. It makes sense. And we want it perfected among us. So give us grace. First, as we... As we each of us long for that word, we taste of your kindness and grace. We stand before the cross and heaven forbid that we look at any other person in our lives except through the lens of mercy and grace. And then empower us to love with earnestly sincere hearts. Save us from our malice, our hypocrisy, our envy, our slander. Save us from these things. They're in our hearts. Overcome them, Jesus, by your love. Love conquers all things. Love this congregation. May it be known as a city set on a hill, a light shining in the darkness. May it be known as a hospital for the weary, for the struggling, for the outcast. May it be known for its love. In Jesus' name, amen.